right, Shabbat Shalom again. And we're ready for the message. I know there are people still talking and lingering in the back, but we're going to go ahead and start anyway. And this week, we're, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Devarim, what book is Devarim? Chapter 18, starting in verse 14, we're on the three and a half year cycle. We have been for, we're almost done, if you didn't notice, with the Torah. It's getting pretty heavy on that one side, isn't it, Larry? <laughs> Saw that. And um, so if Kathy could come up and be ready, we're going to start with Devarim, chapter 18, verse 14. And our title this time is The Prophet. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners, but Diviners. you, Adonai your God, does not allow you to do this. Amen. That is a continuation from last week. Uh, we were talking about all kinds of witchcraft and things like that that are considered what? Do you remember? Toeva, toeva, abomination, right? They're all abominations. And uh, so it talked about what the nations did, and those are abominations, those things. Uh, but here it finishes, and for some reason it goes into the next week as a reminder, you are not to do those things. Amen? Amen. And so we are not called to be like the nations. We're not called to fit in. Amen? Sometimes uh, you feel a lot of pressure in society to fit in, maybe at work to fit in, maybe at school to fit in, in your neighborhood to fit in, a lot of peer pressure, but we're not called to fit in. We're called to be light, light in the darkness. Light looks different than the darkness. Amen? Like the Hebrew national hot dogs, we answer to a higher authority. Amen? We are called to be light. We are called to be light. So no witchcraft of any kind is allowed in the kingdom of Yah, period, period. And we move on from there. Adonai will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves, from your own kinsmen. You are to pay attention to him just as when you were assembled at Horev and requested Adonai your God. Don't let me hear the voice of Adonai my God anymore or let me see this great fire ever again. If I do, I will die. On that occasion, Adonai said to me, they are right in what they are saying. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, will have to account for himself to me. Amen. And so, who is the prophet like Moshe? And so this has been a lingering question, because imagine yourself having lived through the time at the mountain when God gave the Torah. Imagine yourself hearing the thunder and seeing the lightning in this cloud, this like volcanic action and hearing the blare of a shofar that kept getting louder and louder and louder and louder, God's shofar, until you were so terrified that you fell on your face that you fell on your face and had to beg that it would stop because you thought you might die. That's how terrified the people were. And this is the God who said to Moses and through Moses that he would raise up a prophet like Moses, who the people would listen to. Notice it's in the singular, a prophet like Moses, who they needed to listen to. Because, why do I say that? Because there are writings, first of all, much of Judaism likes to just disregard or play down against this text and say that, oh, it's a prophet in every generation, or it's, uh, you know, it's just prophecy in general. That's not what the text is saying. That's not what the text is saying. It's in the singular. 
And by the way, who's the first person that people, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Um, who's the first person that people think is the prophet like Moshe who came after Moshe? The first person thought of by many Jewish people or people if you're reading through the text of the Bible is Yehoshua, the very next person who takes over after, right? But if you look at Devarim 34.10, you'll find that speaking of Yehosh Yehoshua was already alive. When Devar Does everybody know when Devarim, when Deuteronomy was written, Yehoshua was already alive. He'd been with Moses for a while. And the text says, even while Yehoshua was still alive in Devarim 34.10, that there has not arisen a prophet like Moses until this very day. So it can't be Yehoshua. And he's the next one in line. There are many people in our world today and in our country today now who say that the prophet, the prophet is Muhammad. Yeah, it's one of the claims they make. Um, that's what they call him, the prophet, the last prophet and all of this. Is it Muhammad? No, not even close. Not even close. It's good? Yeah, it's, it's much better, I think. You think? Yeah. Uh, 1 John one twenty one. Can we look up 1 John one twenty one? Regarding whether or not it could possibly even be Muhammad. Uh, no, John one twenty one. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Again, my eyes. Uh, <laughs> Remember my eyes. <laughs> what does it say there? John one twenty one. Then who are you? They asked him. Are you Eliyahu? No, I am not, he said. Okay, let's pause for a second. Who are the, who's talking? Who are they talking to? These are people uh, from Yerushalayim, for example, who are, who are coming to Yochanan the Immerser down at the river where he's immersing people, right? And so you know there's an expectation ever since Moshe. So the people in the first century were not thinking, hey, it's a line of prophets. It's whoever happens to be, you know, the main prophet at the time or something. That's not what they were thinking because there was a great expectation for an arrival of the prophet. And you'll see this, and this is about Yochanan the Immerser. Go ahead. Are you the prophet, the one we're expecting? No, he replied. So they said to him, who are you? So that we can give an answer to the people who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? Yeah. He answered in the words of Yeshayahu, the prophet. I am the voice of someone crying out in the desert make the way of Adonai straight. Right, but you notice one of the things they asked him, who, who, who are you? They said, are you? the prophet. Now, everybody knew what that meant. Do you understand? Okay, so that it was an expectation, still looking for the prophet. Now, let's look at John 7, 40, if we could. And as far as Muhammad, you know that like the mosque on top of the Temple Mount, where some of us went on the Temple Mount, you know, and, and, and Islam in general, they say, God is one and he has no son. God, uh, they, they say that God has no children. This is why they don't pray and say, Father, anything. But we pray, Father. And Yeshua taught us to pray, Father, right, to begin our prayers, which is a circumlocution for the name of God. As children of Israel and people grafted in, part of Israel, adopted children, God is our Father. Go ahead. You there? On hearing his words, some people in the crowd said, surely this man is the, the prophet. prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But others said, how can the Messiah come from the Galil? Doesn't Tanakh say that the Messiah is from the seed of David and comes from Bethlehem? 
Okay. <laughs> Missed the one there. So what's the context here, and who are they talking about? These are the, the people uh, in Yerushalayim who are celebrating at Sukkot. Sukkot is ending. It's just about over. It's Hoshana Rabbah, the great, the great Hoshana, the great day, you know, save us, and all of this. And they're talking about Yeshua, and they're wondering, and, they're, and some of them are saying, he is what? The prophet. Now, we know that there are many kings of Israel, many kings of Judah, but the ultimate king is who? Yeshua. There are many high priests throughout time of Israel, the time of Israel, many high priests, but there's one ultimate high priest. And who's the ultimate high priest? Yeshua. There are many righteous men. Yeshua's father was a righteous man. Noah was said to be righteous in his generations. There are several people who are said to be righteous ones, but there's one Ha Tzadik, the righteous one. And who is that? Yeshua. And likewise with prophets. There are many prophets through time. Not like they're all over the place today. There are too many people claiming to be prophets. But there are a lot of prophets through time. But there's ultimately, there's, there's one ultimate prophet. And who is that? Yeshua. He is the prophet. The one like Moses. Right? And there are, let's look at um, scriptural witnesses. Acts 3.22. And see if the scripture tells us that Yeshua is the prophet. And while Kathy's looking for Acts 3.22, let me ask you a question. How many ways can you think of that Moshe and Yeshua are alike? Don't read. It's cheating. Okay. You got it? For Moshe himself said... Adonai will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You are to listen to everything he tells you. Go a little further with that. Everyone who fails to listen to that prophet will be re removed from the people and destroyed. There you go. That's pretty serious, right? We need to know who is this prophet because people who don't listen to this prophet will be removed from the people and destroyed. Look up the other Acts 737 while I speak. So how is Yeshua like Moses? They're both from Israel, verse 15. Uh, both come to the people, come to their people twice. They're both rejected the first time and accepted the second time. Yeshua will be accepted the second time, Scripture says. They both give God's word. Moshe is known probably most, more than anything for giving God's word. God's word comes through Moshe, right? He, who wrote the Torah by inspiration of the Ruach HaKodesh, but who wrote the Torah? And who, what did Yeshua do? Did he give God's word to us? He is God's word to us. Then also he gave a very special message from a mountain as well that you might remember. Amen. He is a teacher of God's ways. They were both teachers. Moshe didn't just give us the word. He also taught the word to the people but when giving judgments, for example. And he taught other people so that they could judge. So he delegated, right? And taught them so that they could lead. Both were good shepherds of Israel. There are many bad shepherds of Israel. There are not as many, but there are some good shepherds of Israel. But the best shepherds of Israel... Yeshua, of course, and Moshe was a good shepherd. They were both humble. They were both honest. They both had servant hearts. Moshe didn't want to be the leader, you remember. <laughs> All right? They both did miracles, right? And there's a, obviously also a tie. About a month from now, there are many ties we'll see at the Passover, the Pasach, right? Okay, did you find it? This is the Moshe who said to the people of Israel, God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers. That's very clear, right? The scripture is saying this is the prophet and it's talking about Yeshua. 
the one who is like Moshe. The implications of this are important. The implications are for anyone Jewish who happens to be stumbling by and listening here, or maybe somebody who hasn't really accepted him, maybe in the room and we don't know or something, the implications are that if you don't listen to this prophet and do what he says, what did the verse say in 322, X322? That person will be cut off from the people and destroyed and destroyed. We don't, it's not just enough, this is something else, it's not just enough to know that Yeshua is God's son, to know that he is the Messiah and have that mental assent to this. It's, that's not enough. We've got to what? Obey him. We've got to Shema. We've got to listen to him and follow his teachings, not, just, not even just know his teachings, not just mental assent to who he is, not just mental assent to what he said, but we've got to actually live it out. Amen? Amen. Uh, 20 to 22, back in Devarim. But if a prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name, which I didn't order him to say, or if he speaks in the name of other gods, then that prophet must die. You may be wondering, how are we to know if a word has not been spoken by Adonai? When a prophet speaks in the name of Adonai and the prediction does not come true, that is, the word is not fulfilled, then Adonai did not speak that word. The prophet who said it spoke presumptuously. You have nothing to fear from him. Okay, so first of all, we have to say <laughs> we're not living in the monarchy of Israel right now. So when you hear somebody and you know they're prophesying and they're a false prophet, don't go and try to kill them. Because even if, even if we were, there was a court system set up for that, okay? So don't do that. We have, America has its own court system and lives by a different kind of laws. However, we do need to take these lessons to heart. It talks about prophets who presumptuously, everyone say presumptuously, presumptuously, speaks a word in my name which I didn't order him to say. I think this is rampant around the world these days, rampant. People saying for just because it suits their agenda or something, thus says the Lord, or even coming to leaders said, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that, when they're speaking presumptuously. And I think God takes it very seriously from what we just read. If we were living in the monarchy, such a person could be taken, right, to the courts and wind up dead. Don't speak presumptuously in God's name and say, God told me to say this or that. If, you, if God didn't do that, don't play games with God. Amen? Now, you might say, this could be a dangerous game. What if God did tell him that something? And, 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 I, you know, and I'm saying something to them about this. I'm, I'm, are we blaspheming the spirit? Right. Well, so we have to have some understanding of what kind of things might God actually say and how can we know if a prophet is true or false. Right. So there are some tests that that we have predictions in, in this text. Verse 22 tells us if they make predictive prophecies, that is, they're telling us if by the way, if it's God speaking, it's not really predictive. It's just out and out, this is what's going to happen. But if a prophet says something and it's of a nature like this is going to happen in the future and it doesn't happen, guess what? False prophet, right? False prophet. Everybody knows that one. But not as many people know Devarim or Deuteronomy 13 verses 1 through 6 where the text speaks about the dreamer. And we covered this not too long ago, right? The dreamer which is what many Jewish people say Yeshua was, the dreamer, right? Or one of the dreamers. What does the dreamer do in this text? In Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 6, it says, this is a person who leads the people astray to worship other gods. If there's someone who's telling you, who's, who's saying that they're prophesying in the name of God and telling you to worship other gods, like Ishtar or something, I don't know, for example, well, maybe that's, that's, 
maybe problematic. Maybe that should raise red flags in your mind, right? Leading people to worship other gods. That's a bad one. And, and then we see speaking against the Torah in verse 5 of Devarim 13, where it talks about what this dreamer does. How, how is it that they're leading people to worship other gods or to go against Adonai? Is the false prophet will teach them to go against Torah. How many prophets you think are in our society today who are making all kinds of prophecies in places and making statements that go against God's Torah and saying that they're prophets? They're very dangerous game that they're playing. It occurs to me that maybe these might be some of the people who will be saying on Judgment Day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that in your name? And he will look at them and say, Depart from me, I never knew you. As he turns away the lawless ones into the lake of fire. We are called to, if, you, if you're wondering, well, maybe we shouldn't do this. It might be just too dangerous. We should just accept anything that anyone who says they're a prophet. No, the scripture says we are, this is a command, test the spirits. Look at your neighbor and say, test the spirits. Test them. Why? To see if they are of God. We need to test them, not just listen to anybody spouting anything that occurs to them or suits their agenda and says that they're prophesying. No, we're to test the spirit to see if they are from God. A spirit, den another is another test. A spirit denying Messiah Yeshua came from God is an anti Messiah. Okay? Because that spirit's out there too right now. And that's in 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Okay. In the next section, um, I don't need you to read the next section. It's about the cities of refuge. Devarim 19, 1 through 7. The people are told to divide the land. When they come into the land, to divide it into three parts. This is the part of Israel that's over the river, the part that God ha himself had said, I'm giving you this land. This is the promised land, right? He, they said, he said, divide it into three parts. After you divide it into three parts, you to choose one city in each part and prepare roads. Why? It's even to so far as to prepare roads. What do, what do prepared roads help you do? Move a little faster, right? Move a little faster. How many well when someone's chasing you, you want to move a little faster, <laughs> right? This is, this is uh, so th there's a circumstance here. Someone who kills someone by accident, not a murderer, so that they can, you know, because the scripture says the killer who does it by accident didn't deserve to die in verse 6. And there's, that's why we're, they're making these cities of refuge where someone who kills someone by accident without hatred in their heart, they did not hate. It was a mistake or an accident is the circumstance. They can flee to this city and they can live. Understand? So why, make, why choose a city in each of the three parts? So that it's easier to, for them to, accept, to access that place. It's closer to them. Not only is it closer, but there should be prepared roads to get there, making it that much easier to go faster to get there. Okay? They are protected, the text says, and many uh, versions, almost every version said, protected from the next of kin avenger. The words in Hebrew, goel hadam the redeemer of the blood. The blood that was spilled, there is someone who's going to try to redeem it, right, with your blood, like get a payback, you might say. A next of kin avenger, someone related to the one who was killed, even by accident. But there's more of a message in this, this message about the cities of refuge. There's something that happens, and it's not in this text in Devarim, but the cities of refuge are talked about in the book of Bedim, Bamidbar, uh, chapter 35, that's Numbers, right? 35, 25, and also Yehoshua, Joshua, that's chapter 20 and verse 6, we find that what would happen, is the person supposed to live in the city of refuge the rest of their life? Maybe, but there is an opportunity, maybe, 
for some of them to leave that city. When does this happen? Do you know the text? If the current high priest dies, and even in Judaism it said, the, the, how this is understood is that the blood of the, or the life of the Kohen Haggadol at the time provides, guess what? Atonement is the word that's used. Atonement for those who have killed even, right? It's interesting that the death of a high priest would bring atonement to others. Do you see a shadow there? <laughs> All right. In verses 8 through 10, let's, let's read verses 8 through 10. That's a shorter section. If Adonai your God expands your territory as he swore to your ancestors that he would and gives you all the land he promised to give to your ancestors, provided you keep and observe all these mitzvot I am giving you today, loving Adonai your God and always following his ways, then you are to add three more cities for yourselves besides these three, so that innocent blood will not be shed in the land Adonai your God is giving you to, as an inheritance, and thus blood guilt be on you. And we know that very soon after this, right, what will happen? They will expand before they even go into the land. They're going to conquer some kingdoms on the east side of the river, and, and then they're going to divide that into areas so that they can have three more cities on the east side where people who die can uh, flee so that they can be safe if they weren't murderers. Uh, by the way, if someone was, well, I think it comes up later, so I'm going to hang on to that. But let me say this. I, I, it really struck me this time. It says about the expansion of Israel, it says, as Adonai Elohecha, Adonai your God, promised your ancestors. That really struck me. Adonai Elohim promised the ancestors that Israel not just would get the land, but that they would expand. That they would expand. That struck me. And there's a, what is this, key... Tishmor et kul ha mitzvah hazut la asota. What is that? For you will, or when you will guard all the commandment, this commandment to do it. Are you with me? This expansion is hinged upon this, obedience to all of the commandment. When Israel is living in obedience, and this is, again, like was brought up earlier, all of what happened to Israel throughout all of history, the people of the past are a lesson to the people of the present. We need to learn to learn to um, to get the lessons from history and incorporate them in our lives, right? And here, what we see is, if you live in obedience, God will bless you in various ways. And one of those ways is the expansion of your territory. It's a, it's conditional when or because you will keep all of this mitzvah to do it. And it's notice that the that the mitzvah. All the commandments are told, it says in the singular, this mitzvah, right? Like it's one, it's one whole, you see? You can't say as a society, we're going to pick and choose which commandments we want to follow and expect to be blessed and say we're not going to do those. Well, okay, we won't, we won't allow murder, but... Stealing, that's okay. We don't really care. As long as you're in this party or something, for example. Right? You can't do something like that. Okay? You can't cherry pick the commandments and expect to be blessed. Because if you're breaking some, you're, you're bringing the curses on yourself. You understand? All right. So they add three more cities because they expanded. Because they were living faithful. And, that's, and that goes to show... Um, what is spoken of about the generation of Yehoshua that they did follow God while he was alive until the end of his generation. 
And what happened? Expansion, expansion in the land as well as the other side of the river. Okay, so next uh, is, it says, so that, um, verse 10, so that. That's a purpose clause. The reason that you need to protect these people who killed by accident, in God's eyes, they don't deserve death. He's saying that it's innocent blood. It says, so that innocent blood will not be shed in the land. That's interesting. If, something, if you do something but it's totally by accident, you had no plan, no hate in your heart. Like the example is you go to chop down a tree, but the head of the axe flies off and hits somebody behind you and kills. God's saying innocent blood. So the innocent blood will not be shed in the land. You think God knows when you do something on purpose or by accident? You think it makes a difference for him? You remember, the, have I told you the story of the bear, the bear in the cornfield, <laughs> right? The harvest the, is coming. The hype, it's time for um, the end of the season. Winter's coming. The bear has to get all the food into his cave so he can last through the winter, right? Most of the time he'll be sleeping. Anytime he gets up, he's got to have something to eat to sustain him, right? So he goes to this cornfield. And when you see corn in the Bible, it's usually really talking about kernels of wheat, not kernels of corn. Anyway, uh, so he goes to the field and he grabs as much as he can. It's a vegetarian bear, apparently. So he grabs as much as he can, yanks it out of the ground, rawr, right? And heads back to his cave. Rawr, 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 rawr. And as he's going, some of the corn inevitably falls, right? Out of the, because he's trying to hold it with his arms. He doesn't have a basket or something. Some of it's going to fall, right? And so he gets, uh, he tries to, he tries to, he gets a little frustrated. He tries to reach, bend over and reach the corn right? To pick it back up again. What happens when he starts loosening his arms to get the one little piece of, piece of wheat that fell down? More is going to fall. That's right. Now he gets a little more frustrated. Rrr, 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 rrr. He starts reaching down to grab that, and then more falls out until he gets so frustrated he just takes, what does he do? He takes all of it and just throws it to the ground. Whoosh. Rrr, and he goes back to the field, right? He's not going to try to pick up those little ones. He goes back to the field. And tries to reach, and he does, and he does this. He rips out, rips out a bunch more, and tries to head back to the cave, and it happens again. The whole process, and he goes back again, and he drops some more, and the whole process repeats again. And you might think, what a stupid bear, but you know what? That's us. That's us. We're the stupid bear sometimes. We think. You know, we try to do everything in the Torah. And sometimes if we fail in one little point, we feel so bad and we try to get that one back, you know. I got to get this one right. And, and there's a little bit of pride involved with that. So guess what? You've already dropped another one because pride. And you're struggling to get that one and you're struggling so hard you might fail in some other areas. You might get angry with other people because you're frustrated. And you drop some more. And we get frustrated. And if we don't control ourselves like the stupid bear, then we wind up giving up and saying, rah, and getting all frustrated. Maybe, maybe our prayers, if we even bother to pray to God, or maybe grumbling to the rabbi, our, our you know, shouts of rage. <laughs> shouts of rage instead of shouts of praise. And then we gather ourselves together. And we try again. The lesson of the bear with the cornfield is get what you have and keep it and guard it and then get more and keep it and guard it and then get more and keep it and guard it to do it. Amen? But there is such a thing as capital punishment. Let's read 19, 11 to 13. However, if someone hates his fellow member of the community, lies in wait for him, attacks him, strikes him a death blow, and then flees into one of these cities, then the leaders of his own town are to send and bring him back from there and hand him over to the next of kin avenger to be put to death. 
you are not to pity him. Rather, you must put an end to the shedding of innocent blood in Israel. Then things will go well with you. There is such a thing as capital punishment in the Torah. Notice the person who deserves it is not one who kills by accident. They lie in wait. This, in, this, this is intentional. It's premeditated. Or they, they attack. The guy who's swinging his axe to cut down a tree and the axe head falls off, he's not attacking someone, right? But this person attacks. And it says this person hates the one they're killing. To such a person, it says in verse 13, you're not to pity him. But send him back to the avenger. That's not innocent blood. And again, going back to the avenger, notice the way you find out if this person is guilty or not is through a court system. You don't just guess. There's a court system that was set up. This is not talking about vigilante justice. Okay? And this would, it says, put an end to the shedding of innocent blood. So this killer is also is actually shedding innocent blood, and that's something that we need to put an end to. How many know God's ways are much wiser than man's ways? If we handled things God's ways, society would be much better off than handling them man's ways. There are consequences to sin. The fall shows us a consequence to sin. All of creation shows us now consequences to sin. And we can see in particular, speaking about a person killing another person, God instituted consequences for that particular action all the way back in Bereshit, in Genesis, chapter 9, verse 6. If you spill the blood of another to die you get killed in response. We see it in Leviticus in two different places. We see in Romans, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That's why we need Yeshua. If you want to know more about the debate on capital punishment and various views, I would encourage you to get this book up on the top here, Moral Choices. It'd be great for a study group. If you have a study group that meets, uh, moral Choices, an Introduction to Ethics, and these are this is a book by believers. It uh, goes very in-depth in a lot of the issues that are hot topics today, um, and so you can be well-informed, and you can help other people understand as well. Another uh, interesting uh, issue associated with capital punishment is there was a woman... Um, you know, we think when you come to Yeshua, right, all your sins are wiped away, right? In God's eyes, all your sins are wiped away. In other words, your eternal punishment goes away. But you know, there are consequences to what you do in this life. You know, there's still, you know, there's still consequences here to things you've done in the past. God might be gracious and take those, thing, those consequences away, and he might not. Do you understand? There can be consequences in this life. There was a woman, Carla Faye Tucker. Uh, and there's a movie, Carla Faye uh, Fay Tucker, uh, Forevermore. This was a drug-crazed prostitute who went on a killing spree with a pickaxe, a pickaxe murderer, right? But while she was in prison, while she was in prison, she came to be a believer. And this isn't one of those claiming to be a believer, to be a believer but not really. This wasn't one of those posers. You know what I mean? She was sincere, and everyone around knew she was sincere. It was real. She really did come to Messiah. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of preachers in the area started to come to her aid and call the governor because she had, she had earned the death penalty, and it was going to be carried out. And they all came to her aid. There were protesters outside with signs, and they were saying, you know, free Carla Faye and all this stuff, Right? But what what's the most interesting is Carla Faye Tucker's attitude. 
Carla Faye Tucker didn't have the attitude of fear or that she was being treated unjustly. Carla Faye Tucker understood that what she did had consequences. She also understood there were, you know, that her eternal penalty was wiped away, that she was going to the kingdom. Carla Faye Tucker went to, to her execution with a smile and a song. She held no grudges against people who decided her fate because she understood that it was justice. It was right for what she had done in this world. And she looked forward to the next life. She was a true Talmud. There are many sins unto death in the scripture. Adultery. And that includes those who were engaged but committed adultery. Because if you were engaged, you're considered married already. If you commit, so it's still called, committed, it's like adultery. Homosexuality, bestiality, wedding a woman and her daughter. Prostitution for the daughter of a Cohen was a death penalty, a sin unto death. Murder, kidnapping was a sin unto death. That seems very just to me. What are you doing? You're stealing a person's life. Think of human trafficking. You think that how much human trafficking do you think there would be if that was the penalty? Get these cursing or attacking your parents. How much disrespect for parents do you think there would be? Rebellious children after being disciplined. The parents have given up on the child. You know, there are some children, and you've seen it in the news, children who wind up going, they're just so evil, and they go do atrocious things in society, hurting and even killing people. But th sometimes they're not even tried as adults, or they just go to like a juvenile hall or something for a while, and this sort of thing, and you wonder... It's just like, this is so crazy. And you know what? God understands that. And in God's view, a person who the parents of the child even give up on them was a sin unto death. Blasphemy, witchcraft, idolatry, sacrificing children. Our society is sacrificing children. Contempt for the judge. Oh, wow. When the judge, when you go to the judge with a case and the judge declares this, you know, this is how it's going to be. Here's my judgment. You are to live by the judge's judgment, right? If, if anything, you can take it to a higher court until you get to the highest court and then you live by the judge's judgment, judge's judgment, right? Contempt for the judge not going by that was, guess what? A sin unto death. God is a God of law and order, not of chaos. People who ignore laws, think about that. People who ignore laws in society and want nothing but chaos. What kind of a society does that lead to? Right? Justice. Somehow these got out of order. Justice. Remember, Yeshua did not come, to, when you're talking about these things, Yeshua did not come to abolish the Torah. And Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11 says this. It says, because the sentence against an evil act is not executed quickly, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. Do you understand? If, you do, if a society is, is afraid or just doesn't want to judge just judgment against an evil act and do it quickly, like they should, then it encourages other evil, evil people to do more evil acts. 
Do you understand? You know this. You know it if you're a teacher in a room with kids. If you don't discipline one kid when they're acting up, they're all going to start acting up. Consequences are what limit and even possibly end evil. In Romans 13, it says, if you do wrong, this is to believers, if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear what? The sword for no reason. They're God's servants. They are what? Avengers to execute wrath to those who do evil. So don't do evil. And you'll have nothing to fear, the text says as well. Boundaries. 1914. You are not to move your neighbor's boundary marker from the place where people put it long ago in the inheritance soon to be yours in the land Adonai your God is giving you to possess. Yeah. Each person's inherited land is to be respected. Do not move boundary markers or build, or build your fence or anything else on another person's property. You hear about people who do things like that. Do not try to modify their borders. Not even if you call yourself the UN, for example, or represent an evil false god, or even if the majority wants to do it. Do not infringe on the inheritance of others. There's, do you know what? There's no word have in Hebrew. You don't actually have anything. The most you can say is, there is to me. Yesh li... Mahonit, <laughs> right? There is to me a car, <laughs> right? But who, why is that? Why is that, do you suppose? Who really owns everything? Everything that you, you might say have, everything there is to you, is only a loan. And it says in the scripture, all the land he owns all the land, and he determines all boundaries. Say that. God determines all boundaries. And who did he give the land of Israel to? The land of Canaan to? The people of Israel. Amen? That is his choice. That's from Acts 17, verse 26 to 27. We're almost there. 19? 15 to 21. Talking about those consequences and witnesses in the court. And this would be the end of the Torah section. One witness alone will not be sufficient to convict a person of any offense or sin of any kind. The matter will be established only if there are two or three witnesses testifying against him. If a malicious witness comes forward and gives false testimony against someone, then both the men involved in the controversy are to stand before Adonai, before the Kohanim, and the judges in office at the time. Pause for a second. What does that remind you of so far? If there's a, a case that, you know, in all cases, it says you need at least two or three witnesses. Is there a court case in the scripture that comes to mind where they had trouble finding witnesses who would agree? For Yeshua, For Yeshua right? Now, let me ask you a question. They, none of the witnesses were agreeing. Now, we just read in the Torah what happens to a, wit a false witness. What happens to someone who testifies uh, and... Right? And they, they want something. We had it in their readings earlier, I think, about a witness. Keep it in your mind. We'll talk about it in a minute. What happens to a witness who intends, who is a false witness, who, in other words, there's an intended penalty for someone who, who does something, right? Yeah, let's, let's read on. The judges are to investigate carefully. If they find that the witness is lying and has given false testimony against his brother, you are to do to him what he intended to do to his brother. How many people were crucified the next day, I wonder, right? <laughs> do you see? 
all those false witnesses who didn't agree, how many of them were crucified, I wonder? In this way, you will put an end to such wickedness among you. Those who remain will hear about it, be afraid, and no longer commit such wickedness among you. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Every charge re requires, say it requires. That's for any charge, requires two to three witnesses. You know, it's the same thing as, re as uh, reiterated in the Brit Hadashah uh, regarding elders. In 1 Timothy 5.19, you have to have at least two or three witnesses or don't even entertain a charge against one of the elders. What does it mean to entertain? Don't even listen to someone who's charging an elder uh, unless there are at least two or three witnesses. These are malicious witnesses. Malicious means someone with evil intent. Do you understand? They know what the penalty is, and they know that they're lying for sure, but they're testifying falsely anyway. Don't they, they, so it seems to me and to God apparently that they deserve that penalty. It's false testimony. And it says, do to him as he intended to do to his brother. In this way, you will put an end to this wickedness. How many people would get up in court and testify falsely if they, in a murder trial, if they knew that they would be killed, executed in place of that person, right? You know what I mean? Who would testify falsely in a murder trial if this was the penalty? Execution. Nobody. And why? So others will be afraid to even try. Because imagine a society where someone could just claim that you killed somebody and lie about it as witnesses and you go to the chair. Right? So, show no pity. And this is the context for life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, or foot for, for, for foot in the Torah. When Yeshua is talking about it, it had gone beyond that. This is, the context here is court system. In the court system, the judge is to judge in this way. When Yeshua is talking about, you've heard it said, and people were just like, if, if you did something to someone, like you poked them in the eye, they poke you in the eye back or whatever. No, that's not what it's talking about. See, that's what Yeshua is talking about. No, you can't do that. There's a court system set up for things. Go to the courts, but you don't take things in your own hands. There's no vigilante justice in the, case, in the kingdom. You follow? There's, there's a difference, okay? Context matters. Context matters. The judge is required to do what's just. Does that make sense? The judge is required to do what's just. We as individuals we should be merciful, as, as merciful as God has been to us. The judge stands in God's place, executing justice. Intervention. In 1 Samuel, we've been reading in chapters 18 and 19 um, about David and Shaul, right? And the issues between them. And one of the statements right here to start with, Va te'ehav michal bat Shaul, Et David. Does anybody know what this is? Any Hebrew students want to give that a shot? Now, and Michal, say Michal. Got to get your in there, right? Michal, and Michal loved. The Michal, well, that's not the whole subject. Michal, the daughter of Shaul, loved. Et says that's the object. What did she love? David. Do you know that there's only one, one woman in a man and woman relationship, like a, uh, where it's not a mother to her son, because th there is one instance. Uh, Rivka is said to love her son, <laughs> uh, Yaakov. But the, where it's a husband and wife or will be husband and wife, there's only one woman in all of Scripture who's said to love the person she's going to marry. One. 
And this is her, Michal. So I thought that was interesting. There's a handful, only a handful of scriptures of named women, and we're talking named women. Uh, uh, and here, there's only a, ha a handful of named men in all of scripture who it says loved a woman, a particular woman. And one of them we're going to hear about next week. Anyway. <laughs>
right? Speak up, be a Jonathan. Be a Jonathan. Good news. Good news. We're almost on the last slide. <laughs> Other good news. John 16, 23 to 17, 8 is what we were reading this week. And it says they're united with Yeshua. We have shalom. Even in troubled times. John 16, 13, right, is talking about in this world you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. United with him, we have shalom. It also addresses Yeshua's divinity. It says in chapter 17, verse 2, Yeshua says very clearly that he gives eternal life. Who can give eternal life other than God? It says also that Yeshua had glory with the Father before the world existed. He had glory with the Father before the world existed, it says in 17.4. Again, there are people uh, in being misled by a false prophet who claims that God is one and he has no son. But here's Yeshua, who is clearly the son of God, and many, many verses say this very clearly. And he, this son had glory with the father before the world even existed. The prophet like Moshe? Who is this prophet like Moshe? Well, Acts told us. But what did Yeshua himself say? What did He said the words, and who is he speaking with? The Father. The words you gave me, I have given to them. The direction we get from Yeshua, on how to live our lives, he has given us, just like Moshe. Philippians 1 tells us that we need to be a good witness, a good witness for the prophet. It says in verse 25 that we should have joy in the faith. And it tells us in 27 and 28, it gives us direction. It says, conduct yourselves in a worthy way. Stand firm. Look at your neighbor and say, stand firm. United in spirit. There are people who wish to divide us, but we are called to be united in spirit. Fighting with what? One accord for the faith. Not frightened by anything the opposition does. And it says in verse 28, at the end of verse 28, this will be for them, for the dividers, for the opposition, for the enemies. When we stay firm, when we stay united in spirit, when we're fighting together in one accord for the faith, and we're not frightened by anything they do, like one of our readers was talking about earlier, this will be for them, for the opposition, for the adversary. This will be for them an indication that they are headed for destruction and you for deliverance. And this is from God, the text says. I thought, I, I thought somebody might get excited out of that. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, thank you. Any? Okay. Moshe spoke of a prophet who would come after him, who would be like him. It would not be a false prophet, but one who would acknowledge and uphold the Torah with justice according to God's perspective. He's the divine Messiah who was there with God from the very beginning, before the earth existed, and who will be there in the end, granting eternal life to those who follow him. Deny him at your peril or walk in his way and find blessing, life, peace, and joy. This prophet is the divine Messiah. The prophet is Yeshua. We rise for the blessing.
And as you're rising, please don't forget next week, hamantashen time for Oneg and costumes, if you have them, appropriate costumes, that is. As we celebrate Purim together, as some would say, Purim, <laughs> Purim, and Being a follower of God is not simply being like the demons and acknowledging that there is a God. Being part of the people of God means accepting him as Lord and walking in his ways with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you'll be blessed, not just in this life, but for eternity. So I pray for each and every one of you. Yevarechach Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai panavelecha v'chunecha Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha Shalom. Adonai bless you and keep you, guard you and protect you. Adonai make his face to shine on you. God to give his favor and be gracious to you, even when the favor is undeserved. Adonai lift up his countenance upon you. Let's maintain his presence, put his presence on you. Pray also around you and even in you by his Ruach HaKodesh and give you his perfect peace that goes beyond understanding, his shalom, B'Shem Yeshua, amen.